to remind you that the vital mini plenary is deemed to be in the present of parliament and constitute a meeting of the National Assembly for debating purposes only. In addition to the rules of the virtual sittings, the rules of the National Assembly, including the rules of the debate shall apply. Members enjoy the same powers and privileges that apply in the sitting of the National Assembly. Members should equally note that anything said in the virtual platform is deemed to have been said in the House and may be ruled upon. All members who have logged in shall be considered to be present and are requested to mute their microphones and only unmute when recognized to speak. This is because the mics, honorable members, are very sensitive and will pick up noise which might disturb attention of other members. When recognized to speak, please unmute your microphone and where connectivity permits, connect your video. I'm saying this thinking about what can happen with uh, the issues of uh, load shedding. So if you, even myself, if I'm load shedded, just inform me that I'm not audible or you can't, I can't be seen or I'm, I'm hanging somehow. Members may make use of the icon on the bar at the bottom of their screen, which has an option that allows a member to put up his hand to raise points of order. The secretariat will assist in alerting the chairperson to members requesting to speak. When using the virtual system, Members are urged to refrain or desist from unnecessary point of order or interjection. Lastly, I wish to remind you that we are meeting in a many plenary session and therefore any decision will be taken in full plenary session of the assembly. Honorable members, the first item on the order paper is a subject for discussion in the name of the Honorable Modiste. She's very ready, she has been, uh, her video has been on all along. Um, on the African Union at 60 years of the emancipation of African people, and advancement of economic integration of the continent. The Honorable Modise, we welcome you to open the debate. Thank you very much, uh, House Chair. This debate is intended to commemorate and celebrate the 60 years of the existence of the African Union, known as the AU. In 1963, the people of Africa gathered in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia to form a united pact to fight for the liberation of the African people. The leaders of our people then saw it fit that the fight for the liberation of the African people cannot be fought in silos. And therefore the birth of the then organization of the African unity, the OAU, cemented the collective offense against the tyranny of colonialism and apartheid. During that historical gathering of the African people in Ethiopia, Emperor Haile Selassie defined the historic moment in the following words, I quote, that this is indeed a momentous and historic day for Africa and for all Africans. Today on the stage of world affairs, before the audience of the world opinion, we have come together to assert our role in the direction of the world affairs and to discharge our duty to the great continent. The Imperial continued and said that, 
Africa is today a mid course in transition from the Africa of yesterday to the Africa of tomorrow. Even as we stand here, we move from the past into the future. The task on which we have embarked, the making of Africa will not wait. We must act to shape and mold the future and leave our imprint on events as they slip past into history. For his part, the then president of Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, outlined the objectives and the responsibilities of the liberated state at the time and for the African people that a whole continent has imposed a mandate upon us to lay the foundation of our union as this, at this conference. It is our responsibility to execute this mandate by creating here and now the formulation upon which the requisite superstructure may be erected. On this continent, it has not taken us long to discover that the struggle against colonialism does not end with the attainment of national independence. President Krumah Ferra said, independence is only the prelude to a new and more involved structure for the right to conduct our own economic and social affairs, to construct our society according to our aspirations, unhampered by crushing and humiliating neo-colonialist controls and interference. We have gathered in this mini plenary to take a step back into history in order for us to appreciate the present and then define our future. For those who may not comprehend what the Imperial Haile Selassie and President Kwame Nkrumah spoke of in 1963 about the liberation of the people of Africa, let me then remind you that for far too long, the people of Africa have been defined as subhuman. The African people were no bodies in the land of their birth. Our land was stolen at the barrel of a gun, our cultures and our way of life disrupted, and our religion ridiculed as barbaric. Those of our adversaries and colonizers hold a firm belief that when God created Africans, God was guilty of creating malfeasance. The rich history of the African people in the science, the arts, astrology, medicine, mathematics, and philosophies were stolen and disrupted. The world learned science and mathematics and yet failed to acknowledge the source, the highest level of plagiarism. We stand here on behalf of the gigantic, gigantic African army, the African National Congress, to send an unequivocal message that as Africans, we have come a long way. Indeed, we are not where we were before, and we are not yet where we want to be. We still have a long way to go but we are inspired by the heroism and the sacrifices of the African people for the total liberation of Africa. The then OAU has made its primary task to mobilize all the support and the resources to ensure that the remaining African countries under colony and apartheid, they too attain their freedom. The OAU provided material and fraternal support to the liberation movements fighting for freedom in their respective countries. As the ANC, we too enjoyed the support of the African people in our quest for freedom. And so is Swapo, ZANU, and ZAPU, and many liberation movements on the continent. Today, the people of Africa are enjoying their freedoms, and what is left is to hit Nkrumah's call on off addressing the social and economic challenges we face. The transition from the OAU to AU was consolidated in 2002 following the decision of the African people through the Abuja Treaty of 1991. The Abuja Treaty laid the framework for the establishment of the African Economic Community. A lot has been done since 1991 to put into practice the agreement of the treaty. As of today, the African people have ratified the African Continental Free Trade Agreement one of the main objectives of the AFTA is to increase trade amongst African countries and thus accelerating the economic growth of our continent. For far too long, Africa has been defined as an exporter of raw materials 
and an importer of manufactured goods. This therefore signaled that Africa has to strengthen its manufacturing base and take advantage of the abundant raw materials it has. It is also important to state that the economic integration and development of Africa should happen in an environment of legality. We all know that for the economic integration to happen seamlessly, there must be some form of regulation of the movement of people and goods across borders. Hence the call for all African countries to ensure that they put processes and systems in place to ensure that the movement of people and goods is facilitated legally. We believe that the economic integration and development of Africa requires an environment of peace and stability. There cannot be development in an env environment of wars and conflicts. In this regard, we are disturbed by the recent conflict in the Sudan, which is forcing many people to evacuate. We stand on the side of our government that the people of Sudan should move from the logic of war to the logic of peace. There is an urgent need for the warring factions in Sudan to cease fire and return to the negotiations table to address their challenges. The people of Sudan deserve peace. In the same vein, we are disturbed by the continuing tensions in the eastern parts of DRC, which have been going on for far too long. The sister people of the DRC have been robbed of peace and stability, and that their rich natural resources are looted while the war goes on. We reiterate the call by the AU that we should silence the gun on our continent. As we celebrate the Africa in Africa Day, we should continue to pledge solidarity with the people of Palestine. We are encouraged by the stance taken by the leaders of our people in the AU to put the matter of occurrence of according to the state of Israel, the observer status in the AU. We believe this is a step in the right direction. Africa cannot be free until the people of Palestine are free. We are facing serious socio-economic challenges on our continent. Our people are poor and living in conditions of squalor. Those socio-economic challenges are compounded by the conflicts that continue to ravage our people on the continent, including the war in Ukraine. We affirm the position of our government that the war in Ukraine should stop and allow negotiations between the two sides. South Africa has been consistent in ensuring that we cannot export war as part of our foreign policy. We shall continue to call for a peaceful resolution to conflicts because that's how we resolved our own conflict. Once again, let's commemorate and celebrate the advancement of the African people by observing the Africa Month and the Africa Day. As former President Tabombegi once said in the sauna of 2001, that as we strengthen the bonds of friendship and solidarity with our fellow Africans, we have an obligation to help ensure that in our country and everywhere else in our continent, no African child should ever again walk in fear of guns, tyrants, and abuse, that no African child should ever again experience hunger, avoidable disease, and ignorance, that no African child should ever again feel ashamed to be an African. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Modise. I will do that to the oncoming speakers, that uh, once you are left with one minute, I will indicate by showing my face. Um, the Honorable Majola. It's your turn. Um, thank you, um, House Chair Percy. It is truly an extraordinary honor for me to take part on this debate. One of the founding principles of the Organization of African Unity, OAU, the predecessor of the African Union, was to achieve independent, independence and self-determination and to ensure the sovereignty of the OAU member states. 
while the majority of African people have obtained political emancipation, the political freedom of African people will never be complete for as long as the conti the, we continue being denied the right for self-determination, uh, which is the violation of a a AU principle an organization cannot afford to look away. The AU must get involved in ensuring that there is a makeable solution between the Kingdom of Morocco and the Western Sahara. The two sisters countries must be able to coexist and respect each another territory. While we have uh, reason to celebrate the political freedom of African people, despite some continu uh, continuous challenges that I made mention refer above, I am worried about uh, growing in incidents of unconstitutional changes in, uh, in government. We have seen it in Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, and now uh, Sudan. We are equally worried about uh, rise of extremism and terrorism in Africa, especially in East Africa and West Africa. Without taking decisive actions against this uh, unacceptable growing threat, our political freedoms will continue to regress and that all threaten the peace and security on the African continent. Therefore, I implore the AU to take a stand and act against individuals and militias groups that are formating this uh, instability. House Chairperson, Agenda 2063 holds many promises for the integration and the economic development of the continent. Still, it is not by any stress of imagination the first of its kind and in the continent. There has been other notable economy agendas established by the AU, such as the Lagos Plan of Action and the Abuja Treaty. Both development plans failed yield the desired results. And it is important that I underscore why those policies failed. Both the Lagos Plan and of Action and the Abuja Treaty embraced the same principles and goals manifested in Agenda 2063, with particular reference to industri industrializations, trade investment, and economy and social development. These economic integration blueprints felt, uh, felt short their objective due to the absence of full engagement with African legislative in institutions, whose primary responsibility involves national budgeting, allocation, and priorities. That was not done, and I am afraid that the African Union has not learned the lesson from those failures. Strangely, they have failed to exploit the unique opportunity available to them through the Pan-African Parliament. One of the primary objectives of the Pan-African Parliament is to facilitate effective implementation of policies and objective of the AU. These objectives is also reflect in the functions of the PAP, consistent with rule four of PAP, of PAP rules uh, of procedure where it provides that PAP shall facilitate the implementation of the policies, objectives, and programs of the union and oversee their effective implementation by the various organizations of the union. We have now, we are now at a defining moment in the AU agenda 2063 as it began to evaluate the first 10 years implementation plan of the agenda and determine if the set goals, priorities, 
areas targets and the continent aims to achieve the national um the national regional and continental level have been realized while we we we, we note above mentioned challenges on economy integration we still have a long way to go in ensuring full economy integration for instance we trade more with outside world than amongst ourselves as African states. And this process, we pay huge amount of tariffs. Look at the issue of, uh, of uh, for instance, of oil. Nigeria got oil and Libya have oil and also including many other African countries who are blessed with oil and gas but we continue to buy oil from other countries outside the continent. Outside the continent. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, House Chairperson. Thank you, Mr. Majola. We proceed now and invite the Honorable B.S. Mposi. Thank you, Ask Chairperson. <laughs> the intensification. Am I audible, speaker? You may proceed. Honor. Yes, you are. If only you can lower yourself. I don't know how. We. Yeah. No, no, not that much. Thank you. Let me see. I'll switch off. Oh, okay. Honorable Chairperson, the intensification of globalization in the last, 20, last years of the 20th century have led to tremendous progress in the development of many nations and countries. However, at the same time, it has resulted in the marginalization of others in the wake of this much celebrated progress. This is evidenced by the denationalization and removing and usurping of the sovereignty of national, nation states, leading to the acceleration of poverty, unemployment, and inequality, both supranationally and within countries. The current new form of globalization is characterized by a deepening technological, economic, and social cultural integration. In other words, the world is being flattened in terms of distance, time, and space. Agent action is therefore required to ensure that the African continent is not again left behind in this round of economic development. Africa must claim its space in the new globalization world. The agreement must be seen in this light as part of the continent's effort to reclaim its space in economic development and thus move away from being regarded as a source of raw materials. It must embed itself in the value chain of all aspects of international economic trade and commerce. In celebrating Agenda 2063 in the 60th year of the AU, it must ensure that the continent becomes a long term, on a long-term basis, a developmental content continent in a concerted effort to create a global powerhouse alongside other similar developing continents, which can progressively compete with the rest of the developed world. This initiative seeks to ensure that we create a single continental market with a population of 1.3 billion people and a combined GDP of 3.5 trillion US dollars by 2035. This will ensure that through the creation of the largest free trade area, we bring together 55 country economies and eight regional economic communities. Chairperson, as of March 20. 23, 54 member states have signed the agreement and 46 of these countries have now deposited their instruments of ratification. This has the potential of lifting 30 million people out of extreme poverty and ensuring that $455 billion is boosted into the economy by 2035. As of 2017, trade, external trade within, I mean, external trade with other countries and within the continent has remained minimal compared to other free trade areas. 
This reflects the limitations of trade within the continent, which is imposed at times by governments in an effort to protect their markets from regional competition. As a result, trading between countries becomes more expensive, whether with the immediate neighbors or far felt markets. Africa has become increasingly regionally integrated through its eight regional economic communities. However, it has been less so integrated into the world global economy and trade and in unable to provide a, a diversified portfolio of exports. Actually, Africa's global share of trade remains low at 2.9%. Regional economic communities and custom unions serve to enhance information sharing, investment fostering, mobilization and increased demand for regional, regionally produced services and products, particularly export oriented ones. They also commit to the development of infrastructure and catalyzing nodal economic development. It further deepens integration within regions in the creation of transport systems and much needed infrastructure like dam construction, electricity, grid creation, and currently migration to digital mode using intensive internet services. This is expected to contribute to the further industrialization and development of the manufacturing potential of the continent. The AFCTA has now entered implementation states. It is planned that it will advance trade in value added production across all services in the continent's economy and contribute towards the establishment of regional value chains. And in this way, contributing to investment and job creation. In doing so, the potential exists to enhance and accelerate industrialization and manufacturing. With this agreement, the following elements will be ensured. The elimination of tariffs and non-tariff barriers in trade and goods, the liberalization of trade and services progressively, cooperation in investment, intellectual property rights, and competition, including cooperation in all trade-related areas and customs matters. In a nutshell, this agreement ensures the introduction of an enhanced regulatory harmonization and coordination. With these elements in place, it is envisaged that the continent will be the largest free trade area by country, population size, and geographic area. It will make Africa the second largest trade, free trade area to ensure the free movement of business and investment creation in a unified customs union. Research indicates that the implementation will ensure the growth of manufacturing and industrial development, tourism, inter-African trade cooperation, economic transformation, and enhanced relations between Africa and the rest of the world. We have experienced limited trade within the continent, which has led to acceleration of poverty levels and, and lack of job creation, particularly among the youth and women. We should know that by 2030, the continent's population will reside in eight countries, particularly Nigeria, DRC, Egypt, Tanzania, Kenya, and South Africa. This will come with the potential to increase Africa's economic up output by 29 million US dollars by 2050. Africa's economic policy makers are committed to a free movement of goods, people, and, and the creation of a customs union. There are notable successes currently with the introduction of a pan-Africanist I mean, Pan-African payment settlement system to, to facilitate payment across borders. In the long time, we need as a continent to secure prosperity by encouraging investment in manufacturing, which will move the continent from the volatile commodity dependent model of trade. Trade facilitation will ensure, will also lead to much needed infrastructure such as new plants, new ports, transportation terminals and digital infrastructure. In this must play also small and micro enterprises who require much needed funding, particularly from the banking sector and support across and within regions so that these micro enterprises, enterprises can play a value add in the extensive value chains that are enabled by the regional economic economies, uh, communities. Funding should also be availed. With this progress, it must also be noted that we face the reality 
of illicit trade and outflows of capital propelled by crime and corruption, manifesting in sophisticated crime syndicates which trade in unprocessed raw materials and resources, drugs and human trafficking in exotic fauna and flora. These are the challenges that the agreement must respond to through data harmonization and rules implementation. The ANC as an internationalist organization and foremost liberation movement in the continent supports AU Agenda 2063, including its flagship programs, foremost of which is the implementation of the AFCA. This is an epoch-making and path-redefining path moment for the continent. The continental leadership, particularly among young people and women, Proceed, uh, Honorable Nkosi, you still have your time. You are muted, Honorable Nkosi. This requires intergovernmental collaboration, expertise, and technology sharing, and participating in the developed world. It also requires enhanced South to South cooperation in areas of technology and scaling up training and availability of technologies. The AFCTA will enhance the continent's competitiveness and productivity as an equal participant in the global and ever-changing economic value change. The ANC supports this motion. I thank you, Comrade Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Gossi. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now call on the Honorable Msan to proceed with the debate. Thanks, House Chair. I will take it on behalf of Honorable Msani. Oh, I've been informed. Thank you, Honorable Zamwini. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Proceed. Thanks, Chair. Chair, in May 1963, 32 heads of the newly independent African states established the first continental post-independent institution, the Organization of African Unity. Article 3 of the Charter of the Organization of African Unity, which remained operative until it was replaced by the African Union Constitutive Act in 2000. One, proclaimed to, amongst other things, work towards a absolute dedication to the total emancipation of African territories, which are still dependent. B, affirmation of a policy of non-alignment with regards to all blocks. Today, while all African Africa is free from the formal colonialism, we all still impair, impu, imprisoned by the new col colonialist and most African states are merely client states of the West. Our leaders have allowed themselves to be mere errand boys of the former colonialists and some have taken the oppression muted by the colonists and African people to another level. Sudan is burning because of the tax leasing that country refused to allow for the democratic reforms and have allowed that Africa, the country resources to benefit only a tiny majority and the Western finance, finances. The war in Sudan is a selfish war fought by two military men who want the continent plundering the country to the exclusion of the great majority of the Sudanian people. Mali continues to be in turmoil because France a rapid formal colonizer refuses to let the people of Mali determine their own uh, future. Here in our country, we are led by a, a Western puppet who is selling our state with white settlers. White settlers for a Sorry, Chair, my, my, my laptop just moved. Chair, apart from the eruption of violence in the country. Your reading is very bad. Before you proceed, Honorable Kangwini, may I just uh, remind all members, please, you only the one who is recognized can press the unmute button. 
please, you do that, you will be removed from the platform. Please proceed, Honorable Nlanguin. Chair, apart from the eruption of violence in the continent, we have a serious lack of visionaries leadership, worthy of being named in the name sentence as those who founded the AOU. The launch of the African continental trade um, area this year follows years of negotiations and preparations, and more recently faced months of delays due to the global coronavirus pandemic. The EFF calls for African free trade area where in high tariffs of on most goods and services will be reasonably reduced. This includes the reduction of barriers to the capital and labor to facilitate investment, development, regional infrastructure and establishment, a continental custom union. It must be noted, Chair, that the overall aim of the African continental free trade area are to increase the social economic development, reduce poverty amongst others. The African continental free trade area could potentially make a big difference to the people trying to export goods from one African country to another. This means we are going to be able to produce in a number of more people are going to be able to afford our products and we are going to be able to be more competitive in Africa. Sadly, we are not where we are supposed to be. At no point in the recent history have we called for Africa to be industrialized, be stronger than they have been lately. Across the continent, industrialization is arguably the most talked about subjects amongst the policymakers. So why has action on the ground failed to move the needle on this important development maker? Across the continent, just 2% of trade was with African countries in the period of 2015 to 2017, compared to the 47% in the Af American 61% in Asia, 67% in Europa, and 7% in the Asia. According to the UN Trade Agency, many countries still do not trade with a former colonial power than they do with their neighbors. The territory in the African countries did more business with each other, they would all benefit creating more jobs and so raising living standards across the continent. It is this realization that the EFF adopt as one as the seven non-negotiable pillars, massive development of African economy. The EFF is the only heir to the ideological clarity and the legacy of the OAU. The only, it's only the EFF that advocate that the return of African land to African people for the full decolonization of society. It is only the EFF that advocates for full integration of the continent in order to unleash their development potential. It's only the EFF that advocates the strengthening of the Pan-African Parliament to give its occlusion lawmaking powers over certain aspects in the continent. It's only the EFF chair that calls for currency of one defense force and a, simple, and a single economy planning unit for the continent. As long as the country in the continent continue working in silos, Africa's will never be developed. As Quran Man once proclaimed, Africa must unite or perish. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Member. We proceed and invite the Honorable Shengwa. Um, thank you very good. much, uh, Honorable House Chairperson. The 55 member states that make up the African Union are home to more than 1.3 billion people and over more than 30 million square kilometers. Africa has vast mineral wealth with, amongst others, the richest deposits of platinum, gold, and diamonds. Our continent holds 60% of the arable land on Earth, which means we have vast untapped potential as regards agriculture and food security. Africa also is a youthful population age 20 in potential. African Union established in 1963 as the Organization of African Unity has four main objectives, which include 
to promote democratic principles and institutions, popular participation and good governance, and to establish the necessary conditions which enable the continent to play its rightful role in the global economy. Uh, honorable Shenguang Azeyamilel, Yenza Njemaru Yahenga, Ngatunga Valibidu. Sure, that's fine. Thank you, Chair. The then becomes, how has South Africa contributed? With our first democratic elections in 1994 and the adoption of our constitution, South Africa broke free from the shackles of colonialism and apartheid to afford every citizen the right to vote. We established a democratic dispensation where the government was representative of the people and put in place mechanisms to promote good governance and uphold democracy. As such, the constitutional court, our parliament and the Human Rights Commission were established. However, 29 years under the ruling party has seen much of these hard won gains hollowed out with most state owned entities on the verge of collapse and unable to provide services. Government representatives facing charges or convicted of fraud and corruption laid bare on the grand scale at the Zondo Commission. Our courts at times, which is most often than not, appear to be the last bastion of our democracy. When it comes to establishing the necessary conditions to enable the continent to play its rightful role in the global economy and in international relations, South Africa has come up short again, thanks to the combined impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, load shedding and the devastating losses due to corruption, as well as the irregular and fruitless and wasteful expenditure on the part of government, our economy is in tatters. According to Deloitte, no economic growth is a real possibility in 2023. Then there is South Africa's conundrum in relation to President Putin of Russia in, in the Ukraine invasion and war. South Africa abstained yet again in the most recent vote for a UN resolution which described Russia as an aggressor in Ukraine and Georgia. This was despite our BRICS partners, China, India, and Brazil, as well as African nations, including Algeria, Cameroon, Egypt, Ivory Coast, Kenya, Libya, Malawi, Morocco, Nigeria, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Tunisia, and Zambia, all voting in favor of the same resolution. South Africa yet again defined, its, defined itself outside the collective. So if South Africa is to play a significant role in the AU, government will need to get its house in order. A country with half its population dependent on grants for survival, ravaged by unemployment, inequality and crime, apparently intent on alienating all its major economic partners by siding with Russia amongst others, is barely able to keep its own doors open for business, let alone provide resources and support for the continent. Therefore, Honorable Chairperson, the AU remains a strategic body for Africa, and South Africa has got a role to play. But the current trajectory to make sure that South Africa plays a meaningful role in the AU is not what is actually taking place right now. We need to press the reset button and actually make sure that we go back to the basics of what it is that forms the AU and what it is that should define the role uh, of South Africa is up in the Your time is up. Uh, thank you. My clock is ringing. <laughs> well, can she take off now? And we proceed and call on Mr. Mulder. I see you are ready there. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. Akbar, Voorzitter. Die Afrika Unie het na 60 bestaansjare min om op te roem. Afrika's economische ellende is daar vir allemaal om te sien. Daar kan met recht gesê word dat die continent dit skouspelachtig misluk om enigszins sy groot economische potentiaal te benut. Sonder enige economische vooruitgang kan daar nie sprake wees van bevrijding. Mense wat die kost of economische vooruitzicht het nie, kan nie vry wees nie. Andere land, soos China, toe neem in sy gretige oor op een continent recht en sy belange daar uitbrei, is het duidelijk dat die teenoorgestelde bezig is om te gebeur. In stede van vrijheid is die continent toe neem in bereid om Chinese invloed te doel en ruil vir kort termijn voordele. Die vraag is, 
Wat het Afrika in 61 jaar bereik om Afrika te bevrijden en die antwoord is weinig. Elsje, since independence, most African countries have suffered coups d'etat. Africa has witnessed more than 200 military coups, successful or aborted since 1960. Africa ranks near the bottom when it comes to competing in the global economy, held back by fragmented markets that inhibit efficiency and constrain economic growth. A new player is emerging in an effort to defragment Africa and boost the productivity of its economies, namely the African continental free trade area. The big question is whether this effort will also elevate the competitiveness of African economies. Competitiveness, the set of institutions, policies and factors driving productivity is a key determinant of sustainable growth and provides a path for effective integration into the global economy. Leading economies are moving away from the rules-based system that has governed global trading arrangements for decades. In this new reality, competitiveness is perhaps even more important for emerging markets in developing economies. In a zero-sum trading landscape, more and more countries are vying for the same market. Only the most competitive, those with strong economic fundamentals and policy frameworks and diversified sources of growth are likely to expand and sustain the growth. Africa faces a host of hurdles to competitiveness and trade. Steps to improve the economic infrastructure and reforms to boost innovation have been stifled by political instability, corruption, institutional resistance and heavy costs associated with infrastructure development and technological catch-up. Africa is desperately in need of a success story, Honorable House Chair, and the current state of South Africa is not assisting at all. South Africa is currently letting our continent down, and the Freedom Front Plus will most certainly support this motion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Murdo. Uh, I don't have a name the UGM, is there anyone in the on the platform? Okay. ATM, I also don't have a name. Do we have a okay? Honorable Jafka. Thank you, Chapman. The African Union occupies a unique role on the continent. President Mbeki has played a crucial role in shaping the AU's peer review mechanism. And we thank him for that. Our focus in this debate pays attention to the role of the AU in promoting regional integration and integrated African markets. Our attitude is also, light, is also in light of the free trade area agreement recently signed by a host of African countries. The African Union has to ensure that we liberalize African market access, access in respect of cross-border trade road transport, including harnessing regulated competition in respect of cross-border passenger road transport. We have read the proto protocol on transport communications and meteorology in the South African development community with interest. We believe that this must be the African Union's greatest preoccupation. Honorable Chair, the AU has to put emphasis on investment in transport infrastructure, including in human resources and technology, improving transport networks in order to foster integration and cooperation between member states is at the heart of the AIC's regional trade and integration draft papers. It doesn't need to be said that the AU must harmonize regional and domestic policies of member states so that they are interactive. It has to gear up public sector support to provide a transparent policy, legal and regulatory environment. We therefore believe that the work of the cross-border road regu regulator forums must form part of the AU's DNA. Honorable Chair, the challenges in cross-border freight road transport and passenger movement including intra-regional trade blockages and fragmented cross-border pan-African infrastructure cannot be left unattended. Our hope is that the AU will work tirelessly to address some of the challenges on the continent. Thank you. 
I thank you, Honorable Member, as I invite the Honorable Minister of International Relations and Cooperation from Mauritius. Let goes on. You are welcome, Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson, and uh, greetings to all Honorable Members. Chairperson, I think it is important that we thank the Honorable Medise for introducing the subject to the House. I believe that there are many achievements led through the Organization of African Unity as well as the African Union that we should be proud of as we celebrate the 60th anniversary of our organization. I would suggest that the Honorable Nkosi and the Honorable Tlengwa should sit with the Honorable Mulder and provide him uh, with a breakdown of the role the OAU played in the fight against apartheid. Our continent has developed a range of roadmaps, which honorable members have referred to. One of the more important is our roadmap to peace and stability in that we still have a great deal of work to do to ensure that we have a continent that is fully peaceful and that has a prosperity that benefits all Africans. It is important that we have the African continental free trade area and that as South Africa through our parliament and our government, we contribute to implementation of the continental free trade area agreement and provide the support to ensure the necessary regulatory framework as well as the infrastructure for logistics and other support that will make the free trade area agreement a reality for the continent. However, Chairperson, I wish to speak today to the ongoing challenge of silencing the guns in our continent and ensuring that we create the foundation for a peaceful and prosperous Africa. We fully support the objective of the African Union of silencing the guns on our continent. Our Agenda 2063 indicated that conflict remains one of the foremost impediments to sustainable development for Africa. It was thus in 2013 that the AU agreed that we should commit to an Africa in which guns would be silent. This forms a key pillar of our Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. We have not yet achieved this objective. Lasting peace has proved elusive in many parts of our continent. However, Chairperson, it is important that we recognize where progress is being made. We have achieved notable success in a number of conflict areas. We have a range of peace deals that have been agreed upon and they have ensured increasing peace and stability. Honorable members would recall the role South Africa played in ensuring that in 2019, the Central African Republic ended its conflict and South Africa has continued to support that country on its road to democracy. And in September, 2018, South Africa again, along with the AU played a role in entrenching peace in South Sudan through the comprehensive agreement. We were honored recently to host the successful African Union-led peace talks between the federal government of Ethiopia and the TPLF. This was in Pretoria in our own country and we were deeply privileged that we were chosen to be the site of this peace process. We were honored by the presence of a high level panel led by former president of Asanjo supported by President Uhuru Kenyatta of Kenya, as well as our own former Deputy President, Dr. Pumzilem Lambo Muka. They successfully facilitated the talks, which resulted in a permanent cessation of hostilities and a peace agreement that is currently being implemented faithfully by both parties. Of course, we agree that the conflict in Sudan has indicated that we should not rest our laurels at the signing of an agreement. We must ensure that we support the post-conflict process and ensure that peace is sustained. We've also noted the important role the AU has taken on in signing 
cooperation agreements in ending conflict with its global partners. The South Sudan deal was mediated through a joint effort by the African Union, IGAD, the UN, European Union, China, the United States, United Kingdom and Norway. In 2017, the African Union and the UN signed the joint United Nations AU framework for enhanced partnership in peace and security. This marked a major step forward in interagency cooperation and helped to create new mechanisms to improve collaboration in entrenching peace and preventing conflict on the continent. I'm also pleased to report that the African Union has made great strides since developing its peace and security architecture in line with the 2013 Lusaka Roadmap. The AU Specialized Committee on Defense, Security and Safety declared that the African standby force had reached full operational capacity in June, 2016. So where we have peace operations to be deployed, the standby force provides capability within a short space of time and particularly in areas where humanitarian needs must be addressed. At the country level, the partnership and support of the United Nations special political missions along with the AU has been particularly important. In Libya, we noted the close engagement of the AU and the UN in contributing to military uh, officers from the warring parties agreeing on practical steps toward a ceasefire agreement and political talks that are to lead to an election for a new parliament in Libya. In Somalia, beyond the UN's mandate to provide support to the AU mission in Somalia through the UN support office in that country, the UN has also been providing support along with the AU for the Somali government to prepare for elections. And in Sudan, the mission in Darfur of the AU and the UN has provided critical support in seeking to work with the transitional government to implement protection of civilians in that area. We have to ensure that we do succeed in silencing the guns. But Chair, as members have said, despite the progress, we as the African Union continue to face notable challenges and our parliament should assist the African Union in addressing these. One of the more important are the severe financial constraints and the perpetual underfunding of the peace missions of the African Union. Our parliament needs to do more to provide support to the AU in this regard. Our continental body continues to be dependent on external donors for support, including the European Union and the United Nations. These support us to make up shortfalls. We must end this dependency and ensure predictable sources of funding for the African Union so that we are able to sustain peace operations. We must always also actively reduce the number of guns present in the continent as they are a source of conflict and violence. The vast number of illicit small arms and light weapons on the continent must be removed from Africa. They remain a primary instrument of violence employed particularly by non-state armed terrorist groups on our continent. At the commemoration of the Africa Amnesty Month 2022 in Togo, the African Union Commissioner for Peace and Security, Ambassador Bankole, indicated that we have to ensure that we mitigate the proliferation of small arms and light weapons in Africa. Our union is also working to narrow the funding gap for activities directed at arms control and removal of weapons from the continent, as well as ensuring that technical and financial support is offered to Liberia, 
Togo and Tanzania to ensure that guns that are a threat are removed. This follows a similar successful initiative in which arms were collected and destroyed in Madagascar, Niger, and Uganda, again led by our African Union. Another challenge is the role of external parties in stirring insecurity in Africa. In many of our continent's fragile states, the activities of foreign countries have undermined regional efforts to curb violence and have contributed to political and social divisions. A case in point again is Libya, where since the start of 2019, a civil conflict between two rival governments has rapidly spiraled into a destructive proxy war. Despite an arms embargo, foreign states have been implicated implicated in the channeling of arms and ammunition to both sides, thus undermining prospects for a peaceful resolution and contributing to a growing humanitarian crisis in Libya. The AU has also been sidelined in diplomatic efforts to solve the Libyan crisis, which have largely been managed and led by parties from outside the African continent. Chairperson, we also believe there are opportunities for the AU to continue to strengthen efforts at silencing the guns. One is the implementation of firm counterterrorism initiatives on the continent. The AU has called for the development of a special unit for countering terrorism within the African standby force. And the United Nations has already committed to assisting the counter-terrorism measures of AU member states. The AU also has a very important role to play in ensuring the improved participation of women and youth in peace and security agenda. South Africa continues to play a leadership role in supporting and advancing the women, peace and security agenda, not just in Africa, but globally in collaboration with a number of partner countries. What this work has done is lead to the creation of a network of women conflict mediators who have been groomed for deployment into conflict zones and who have done amazing work in areas such as Mozambique and in South Sudan. Chairperson, while indeed much remains to be done, the accomplishments of the African Union at 60 are tremendous. And given the challenges we have emerged from, we can only thank the African Union for all that they have done, including supporting our struggle for freedom against apartheid. It is important that we take the moment of this debate to celebrate the achievements of our union and to build on the sense of hope that exists currently in Africa, that we are going to have a true renaissance as our youthful continent rises to the, merit, to the myriad challenges. I thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, the Honorable Minister Dr. Pando. Uh, do, do we have someone from COPE? No. PAC? No. Al Jama. The Honorable Sheikh Imam. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I think there seems to be some network problem, but however, uh, and let me first of all thank Honorable Modisha for introducing this motion. And yes, indeed, the National Freedom Party will support it. Let me start off by talking about the good things that the African Union may have achieved. It helped stop catastrophes and protected people from violence in Burundi, the Central African Republic, Comoros, Darfur, Somalia, South Sudan, Mali. And of course, let us not forget the role that they played in the liberation of South Africa during the days of apartheid. In October 2022, the African Union organized negotiations in South Africa that resulted in a peace deal between the Ethiopian government and the Tigray People's Liberation Movement, and these are achievements. 
Initiatives against AIDS and malaria have also resulted in fewer deaths in the continent. Despite progress, Honorable Chair Chairperson, we must admit, and I must agree with the Honorable Minister, that yes, there is outside influence, influence from foreign governments uh, who cause division, chaos, and mayhem in the African continent, but more importantly, want to have a foot or control over the natural resources in this very rich African continent, very little of which is still controlled by Africans in Africa. And that is why I go back, Honorable Chairperson, to some uh, uh, to what uh, uh, our late leader, uh, Muhammad Gaddafi said, when the slain president of Libya, Gaddafi, articulated his vision uh, of the United States of Africa, and this was in 1999, the vision was very clear. The continent being ruled by one government under a single president with a united defense force and one foreign and trade policy. To protect our continent from the vultures of the West, Africa needs to unite with a united defense force, a consolidated foreign and trade policy which benefits Africans if we have the right people to govern our countries. Of course, one of the major problems we have is a leadership crisis not forgetting looting, corruption, and things in the continent. Now, the question we need to ask ourselves, do we have a pharmaceutical industry in the African continent? The answer is no. Are we, do we have infrastructure, trade, and development programs amongst African nations in the African continent? Very little is happening, okay? Do we have our own currency? No, we don't have our own currency. Don't you think, Honorable Chairperson, that it is time that African countries must come together, elect the right credible leaders so that you can ensure that you enhance the quality of life of the people in the African continent? And that is not happening. I'm not sure if you're telling me my time is up by looking at me, Jim. <laughs> I can't hear you. Are you there? Can you hear me? You have uh, now four seconds to finish. I was going to say it. When I oh. turn my face, if you are left with one minute. So, <laughs> oh, okay. Will, uh, okay, I, I, I will Twitter. But I thank mean, you very much for that, Chairperson. And, and I must also agree, firearms, firearms, and firearms. I think we need a gun-free South Africa and a gun-free African continent. But very importantly, yeah. unless, you, unless you identify credible leadership in the continent, very little or nothing will change. The, the wealth of this Thank you very much. Your time now is up. Thank you very <laughs> much. Uh, I will now allow Mr. Chetty to come in. The Honorable Chetty. You are muted, Honorable Chetty. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Proceed. Speaker. For connectivity, I will have my camera off. Madam Speaker. No problem. Since the inception, uh, Madam Speaker, since the inception of the Organization of the African Union in 1963 and its proclamation, free at last from the bondage of colonialism and apartheid, yes, we are free. And blessings to those struggle heroes and heroines who paid for this freedom with their lives and livelihoods. Our very own Tata Nelson Mandela must rank high as one of those heroes. But are we truly free on the African continent? With the continuous scandals involving one or another African leader breaking out on social media, not forgetting our very own former president Jacob Nkandla Zuma and the current lame back president Cyril Flip Flop Ramaphosa amongst those. One cannot be faulted for believing that emancipation and economic advancement has benefited a few power hungry African leaders and not the majority of the African people on the African continent. Our people are still starving in Africa. We have failed to ensure that the African child 60 years later is on an equal footing to the American, European, or Asian counterparts. The wealth of Africa is in the hands of those few 
who are closely connected to the political elite, while the people of Africa are still chained to poverty, unemployment, and are homeless. If those visionaries that pioneered the organization of African Union had to see how these current leaders in power have lost their moral compass and ideologies, blinded by self-enrichment and greed at the expense of a more prosperous life for the African people. We as South Africa must not shy away from our share of responsibility in failing to fast track the emancipation and economic integration of the African people. We had a fortune, or as some which viewed as misfortune, of having three of our South African leaders, former President Thabo Mbeki, Minister Inko Zizana Dlamini Zuma, and current President Cyril Ramapalapala, who were collectively responsible for the lack of political will and the government's failure to implement and pursue the agenda set out by the visionaries of the Honorable Chair, Honorable Chair, please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I see the hand of the Honorable Khadebe. No, thank you, Chairperson. I'm rising on Rule 82. The member has just desecrated the name of the president. It is unparliamentary. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I heard that too, and he he, he said the chairperson on the point of, of order. But the same chairperson on the point of order. I'm still on the I'm still on the floor. I'm still on the floor, Mr. McLeod. There was a, a a point of order, and I have to rule on it. The member said um, uh, the president of Palapala. The, 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 the order is sustained. Chairperson, Honorable, the member said Honorable, the president Honorable of Leclou, I'm going to move you. I didn't give you permission to speak. I will, I will move from the platform. I, I heard very well, please. And I'm not going to any uh, gadget to check. I heard well, and then I said it is sustained. I'm going to remove you if you keep on talking back to me, because I didn't give you the opportunity uh, that what you said is not parliamentary. Please proceed. Thank you, Speaker. Who are collectively responsible. Please proceed. You... Who are collectively responsible for the lack of political will and the government's failure to implement and pursue the agenda set by the visionaries of the Organization of the African Union in 1963. We as South Africa have also failed the African Union in ensuring that we provided a permanent home for the Pan-African Parliament. 12 years later, the Pan-African Parliament is still housed in rented premises at Gallagher Estate with no clear sign on the horizon of the much promised permanent home, another failure by our African leadership. The African continental free state area, which was conceptualized in 2012 to enhance trade inflation on the continent, only came into force in May 2019, displaying the total lack of urgency to advance inter Africa trade, which has always been demanded by. Let's not forget about the wars and the civil unrest the country raging and the economic impact that Putin's Russia and Ukraine has on the African continent. The fleeing of innocent families, most recently from Sudan and previously Congo, Cameroon, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Mali, Burkina Faso. The team of silence in the guns has failed these innocent families. Where has the decisiveness in making decisions for the right reasons vanished. Where are those African leaders who used to lead the African continent with the courage of the convictions for the benefit of the African people and not themselves? Yes, the AU can claim that it achieved some successes in the past 60 years, but tragically, the agenda set out by our visionary leaders of 1963 has not been fulfilled. Sadly, Agenda 2063 
will be a bridge too far for our current leaders who are punch drunk with their own perceived power rather than the plight of the African people. The vision of leaders such as Ghana, Kwame and Krumah, amongst others in 1963, who advocated for full continental integration as a must to ensure Africa be taken seriously internationally, must be turning in their graves that 60 years later, their vision hasn't achieved the expectations. Thank you. I thank you. Your time is up. Thank you. I will now ask the Honorable Mudise to close the debate as I invite my colleague, Honorable Danji, to take us to the next item. Thank you. Proceed, Honorable Mudise, and you, ask Mr. Honorable Danji to take over. Thank you very much, House Chair. Let me take this opportunity and thank the members who have contributed in this debate in commemorating and celebrating the Africa Day. Indeed, the people of Africa have committed themselves to the total liberation of Africa. We are not where we were and surely not where we want to be, but the Africa and Africans have registered serious progress since 1963. We remain worried, however, about the instability on our continent as it derails as it derails our progress. As it derails our progress in our agenda of the development of Africa, politically, socially, and economically. We have to commit to the adv advancement of the African agenda to ensure the rebirth of the continent through the various initiatives by the AU such as the peer review mechanisms and the integration of our continent economically through the AFC FTA. As South Africa, we shall continue to provide support for peacekeeping missions on the continent and humanitarian support in the event of disasters. Our commitment is visible in the delegated powers of the deputy president of our country to continue with the peace consolidation efforts in South Sudan. As we have quoted former President Tabombik when he said, no African child shall ever again feel ashamed to be African. We shall do everything in our power to define the Africa we want. Let me dedicate and close off my input in, the, in this debate in the memory and legacy of one of our founders of the African National Congress, Dr. Pixley Igaiseme, who later became the president of the ANC. President Seme is amongst those who laid the foundation of the rebirth of Africa. Delivering his seminal speech in 1906 titled, The Regeneration of Africa at Columbia University in the United States, President Seme said, the brighter day is rising upon Africa. Already I see her chains dissolved. Her desert plains red with harvest. Her Zulu land, reflecting the glory of the rising sun from the spires of their churches and universities. Her Congo and her Gambia, whitened with commerce. Her crowded cities sending forth the harm of business and all her sons employed in advancing the victories of peace, greater and more abiding than the spoils of war. Close quote. The NC is a product of a pan-African ideals, and it is a champion of pan-Africanism in words and in deeds. It is a common cause that almost all African countries have attained their liberation and thus realizing the dream of Dr. Seme that the brighter day is rising upon Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable uh, Modise. That concludes the debate. We now move to the second order of this mini plenary, another subject for discussion in the name of Honorable Tsulufe Lobojani on measures to deal with the South African Post Office provisional liquidation and the negative impact this may have uh, on, on the delivery of its core services, including the payment of social grants. 
I now recognize Honorable Bordlan. Thank you, House Chairperson. House Chairperson, in 1994, South Africans stood in snaking lines with much jubilation to cast their first democratic vote, a vote they hoped would bring them political and economic freedoms, a, birth, a rebirth from the inhumane apartheid past. Today, we see those lines daily across South Africa, the sick and desperate enduring harsh elements because the South African post offices just does not have the heart nor the infrastructure to disperse social grants. In welcoming today's debate, Chairperson, it is apt that from the onset we all agree that as members of this parliament who have sworn to be faithful to the Republic, that the South African Post Office is a monumental disaster. This agreement, Chairperson, will assist the debate so we can refrain from political platitude and accusing those who insist on stating the facts about this once glorious entity of being unpatriotic. It is my hope that today, honorable members will choose truth over political expediency. If we do that, perhaps this government can finally take a decisive action about SAPO's future. House Chairperson, let me use this moment to reassure South Africans that Contrary to the propaganda spread by the ANC, the DA would never ever take away anyone's social grant. In fact, a DA-led national government would increase social grants to empower beneficiaries to have more disposable income to come to cope with the rising cost of living. The DA will budget for the introduction of a conditional universal basic income grant at 505 rands per month for adults without formal employment between the ages of 19 and 59, of which the cost is estimated at 157 billion per year. The DA cares. House Chairperson, reporting to the Communications and Digital Committee, SAPO delivered devastating yet expected news that their financial difficulties are ongoing, that they have forecasted a loss of 2.3 billion rand in the 2022-2023 financial year. Simply put, House Chairperson, the 2.4 bailout that Treasury has approved for SAPO is going into a black hole while the future of thousands of SAPO employees hangs in the balance. In the balance. SAPO monthly liabilities continue to increase due to the monthly losses as monthly expenses continue to exceed monthly revenue. Sadly, the Portfolio Committee has received reports from the department that SAPO employees in the Eastern Cape have been killed for trying to expose the rot and corruption in the entity. The DA conveys its deepest condolences to the families who have lost their last ones. The committee has also received reports on how SAPO employees are looting and destroying SAPO infrastructure as they feel frustrated by the uncertain futures they face. These are the unintended consequences of yet another failed state-owned company. House Chairperson, allow me to quote from the SAPO report which reads, SAPO cash flow position is extremely dire as creditors, medical aid contributions, pension fund contributions, and SARS obligation remain unpaid and will continue not to be paid unless urgent financial assistance is provided. On a report, Chairperson, to put this in context, SAPO has outstanding liabilities of 5.3 billion rands. SAPO owes the ill-conceived post office 3.2 billion rand. Essentially, SAPO is over 8.5 billion rands in the red. House Chairperson, the provisional liquidation of SAPO comes as no surprise to the Democratic Alliance or anyone who has followed the downward spiral of this entity in the last few years. Business Administration 101 informs that SAPO could have been salvaged had the ANC not held its myopic views about wanting to control everything. Partial privatization of SAPO could have brought in investment and much better management processes. How and why does the ANC government still consider SAPO a viable investment? Even as, the, as a sentimental gesture, the insistence on keeping SAPO open is just irresponsible and lacking the political agency to reprioritize the funds to help the poor. As we pause for an honest reflection on SAPO, Allow me to categorically state how SAPO is a classic example of what happens when oversight mechanisms are ignored and the governing ANC uses its majority to defend the indefendable, pushing for bailout after bailout, 
with no real benefit to SAPO clients, South Africans. SAPO is a real example of how ANC cater deployment can destroy companies and services that are meant to help the poor. This, while cliches such as our people, are used to pacify those who continue, who continue with their blind loyalty to an organization that has lost its moral fiber. South Africans just cannot catch a break. The irresponsible and prolonged national lockdown has left many South Africans unemployed with no prospects of finding employment as load shedding is shedding jobs. While the 350 social grant relief says as temporary provision for assistance intended for persons in dire material need, South Africans want jobs. The DA maintains jobs give dignity, creating an enabling environment for economic growth and job creation is above the pay grade of the minister of the president and his ministers. The irony, House Chairperson, is that in South Africa, the biggest beneficiaries of the partnership between SAPO and SASA are the criminals. The criminals who loot the state of millions Honorable of Honourable members, time has expired. Thank you. The time Thank has you, expired. Chair. I now recognize the Honorable Minister of Communications and Digital Co Te Technologies. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Honorable Chair, Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee on Communications, Honorable Members of Parliament, Members of the Media, Fellow South Africans. The story of the South African Post Office is intertwined with the story of the development of the Republic of South Africa. This entity which was formed over 200 years ago has lived from the formation of the Republic, two years of oppression and struggle till democratization. It is therefore imperative that we state upfront that saving this historical institution and turning it into a viable business which continues to serve the people of South Africa is our priority. As a state-owned organization, South African Post Office plays a crucial role in contributing to South Africa's social and developmental goals by providing postal, logistics, financial, and government services via its postal network. At its core, it is mandated to provide these services to citizens, particularly vulnerable individuals, and communities in an affordable and convenient manner at a national scale. Within this context, this postal network is a strategic contributor ensuring economic inclusion, improving living condition, and is a catalyst to reducing inequality and, and alleviating poverty. Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, since its establishment in 1792, the dominant role of the SA Post Office has been the collection and delivery of letter post. However, evolving market factors and technological advancements have displaced the need for physical letters. As a result, letter volumes are declining and in tandem, Revenue has reduced from 3.4 billion in 2015 to 2.6 billion in 2022. This trend has posed a significant threat to the sustainability of the SA Post Office in its historical form. Additionally, the growth of electronic financial platform has posed a further threat to South African Post Office financial services segment as transaction volumes and revenue have declined. In 2014-15 financial year, the entity experienced a prolonged and a crippling strike, which lasted about five months from which it has never fully recovered. At this point, SAPO entered financial distress and the shareholder placed the organization under administration. Other contributing factors in the story of the South African Post Office are ill-conceived from past management, which includes the reinstatement of almost 500 employees who had been dismissed following the illegal five months long strike. During the period between 2012 and 2019, a total of 10,384 part-time employees who were previously only engaged by mail centers during peak periods were absorbed on a full-time basis. Furthermore, monies intended for a turnaround strategy were used 
for consumption instead of investment in infrastructure and modernization. Therefore, these instances adversely affected the cost structure of the company. The advent of the COVID-19 exacerbated the financial challenges facing the entity, further affecting its ability to pay its creditors. Government has over the years embarked on several interventions to get the SA Post Office back on track. These include a total of 7.3 billion cash injection between 2016 and 2019. Partnership with CETA and Post Bank on infrastructure development and sourcing of expertise from the private sector. We've also defended SAPO's reserve market of one kilogram and package distribution in the entire republic. In fact, we are currently in court because there are other unregistered players encroaching in that space to the detriment of the South African Post Office. Through partnership with the Department of Transport for 4 million motor vehicle licensing are issued by SAPO on an annual basis in the entire Republic, except for DA government in the Western Cape, which refuses to come to the party. Working with the Department of Health, SAPO distributes chronic medication to patients at their doorstep all over the country and social grant recipients receive their social grants from SAPO on a monthly basis. Notwithstanding the above, SAPO has seen slow recovery over the past few years despite these interventions from government. On the 9th of February, 2023, a judgment was issued to place SAPO under provisional liquidation which led to a provisional liquidator being appointed on the 30th of March this year. Working with the provisional liquidator, the entity continues to ensure provision of essential services are not affected. Honorable members, we want to assure you that we, we, that we have been working tirelessly with the entity to explore various options to find an optimal approach within the legal prescripts and confines of the provisional liquidation to save the entity and ensure business continuity. In line with the overall objective to save SAPO from liquidation, the ministry and the department together with SAPO have explored various options to save the entity. We will therefore in the next coming week table an approach to cabinet for approval to ensure business continuity. The services of senior legal counsel and external lawyers have also been sourced to provide advice and guidance on the optimal option in dealing with these matters. Our plan is to get the matters resolved before the 1st of June 2023 final court date so that the entity can continue to operate. For now, it is vital to assure the public that we are working tirelessly to ensure that the optimal option to mitigate against liquidation is put in place with the objective being to save the entity. This will ensure that the impact of the liquidation on an ordinary South African making use of support services is mitigated against. Honorable members, honorable chair, a critical support post office is to ensure that we reposition and modernize the entity to respond to services needs of our people in the present digital era. It is for this reason that the cabinet has already approved the post of tomorrow strategy which reviews SAPO's operating model to restructure it in such a way that it can operate as a sustainable, productive, and efficient entity. It thus eliminates organizational duplication and inefficiencies by restructuring the organization in such a way that the entity is positioned to become a modern, sustainable entity over the short term to medium term. The priority focus areas of the Post Office of Tomorrow Strategy include positioning the entity to become the following a leading logistics service provider for South Africa and region, a logistics service partner to other e-commerce and logistic players, including SMMEs and informal traders nationally and internationally based on its expansive postal work, an e-commerce hub for South Africa and the region, business digital hubs that also serve as digital hubs for, continue, for communities and designated authentication authority that also fulfills its role as a national trust center in the age of digital entity and services. To give effect to the post office of tomorrow's strategy, the department has already embarked on the amendments to SAPO Act and as such the SAPO amendment bill has already been introduced in parliament for processing. We want to conclude by reiterating that 
government's main objective is to ensure that this entity is, is repositioned, modernized, and continue to serve millions of South Africans it has been serving over the past 200 years. As reported here today, Honorable Chair, and to the Portfolio Committee earlier in the week, much of this paid work has already been done, and we are in the process of laying the bricks towards activating the post of the future. We also want to invite South Africans to walk this journey with us as government to ensure that we turn around the fortunes of South Africa's post office for it to live another 200 years and beyond. Working together, we can grow the South African post office. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable Minister. I now recognize Honorable Mastango. Thank you, Honorable Chair. In keeping with the writing, the wrongs of apartheid and ridding people of South Africa of the inhumane, undignified way of living, Parliament in 2004 established SASA Act to, among other things, ensure the effective, efficient, and economical use of funds to designated for the payment to beneficiaries of social security. The promotion and protection of the human dignity of applicants for and beneficiaries of social security. The protection of confidential information held by the agency other than as is contemplated in section 16. Honest, impartial, fair and equitable service delivery mechanisms to regulate community participation and consultation. And close quote. Instead of the above and in total contravention of the act that established the agency, the following are, the, are some of the responses to questions we have been asking to the Honorable Minister of Social Development. First, the total potential loss over the last 10 years is projected at 536,683,179 rands and 12 cents. Some of the cases are not yet finalized to come to the full determination of the actual loss. 215 million in potential loss in 2018-2019 and 109 million rand in 2013-2014. 82,084 Sasa cards were stolen in the past five years and 23 million rand were stolen from cards since 2018. The questions yielding these responses are triggered by inquiries we are fielding as members of the portfolio committee from applicants and beneficiaries of social grants who, after not receiving their grants on published dates, they've had to endure long queues repeated over days as they are not assisted for one reason or another. The chaos that has accompanied grants grant payments in South Africa over at least 10 years shows that the department and SASA have not learned any lessons from the series of lapses in the grant payment system. Chairperson, serious observations and possible solutions have come from civil society, the opposition parties like the Democratic Alliance, and all these have fallen on deaf ears. Today's debate is a direct and desperate attempt to seek measures that will save the lives and livelihoods of beneficiaries who are on the receiving end of daily closures of post offices. The measure we continue to bring to the table is the institutionalization of the grant payment system in South Africa. The legislation that established the agency is clear on this matter. I do not have time in this debate to recount the challenges that have had dire effects on individuals and families who are recipients and beneficiaries of social grants. It is sufficient to state that the legislation for the most part has not been adhered to and the results of that is the mayhem experienced by people who by category are vulnerable and should therefore be protected from further vulnerability from a government they installed to govern them. 
in a February portfolio committee meeting, SASA officials themselves told the members of parliament that SAPO had failed to provide dignified services, adequate equipment to comply with norms and standards and adhere to a payment schedule time. This is a direct contravention of the SASA Act and is a clear but disturbing demonstration of SASA throwing their hands in the air about their failures to deliver on their constitutional mandate to, and I quote, act eventually as the sole agent that will ensure the effective and efficient management, administration, and payment of social assistance, close quote. It is very concerning, Honorable Chairperson, and frustrating to have to hear about how SAPO and all Postbank are not doing their work. The beneficiaries did not apply to SAPO or Postbank for social grant. They applied to SASA, the agency set up by an act of parliament to pay grants. It is for this reason that as the Democratic Alliance, we call upon the Department of Social Development to consider without delay putting systems in place to institutionalize the payments of grants as outlined in the SASA Act, as the partnering with other entities, which is also in the Act, has proven to be ineffective and a source of indignity and dishonor for many millions of South Africans. The Democratic Alliance will ensure that it institutionalizes the grant payment system in South Africa when it governs in the year 2024. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Masango. I now recognize the EFF. The EFF. I think the Honorable Sonawa just have, is having Let me issues. Just come and check. Can you hear me, Chair? Honorable Sinao, I can hear you clear. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Chairperson, the South African Post Office is dead and the ANC has killed it. To debate the impact of the provisional liquidation on its ability to deliver its core services is strange because already it is struggling and unable to do so. The condition of SAPO has been on a constant decline due to mismanagement, lack of modernization, and competitive ability, and a state that has no financial know-how on how to manage a state-owned entity that is central to the communications ability of millions of South Africans. As things stand, SAPO's liability is set at 5.8 billion and a negative asset value of 6 billion. It is now a definitive fact that the entity has only been able to generate revenue to the amount of 2.5 billion for the financial year of 2022-23, meaning that it has no prospects of servicing its debt with a consistent trend in declining revenue. Now the debt situation of SAPO is interesting because when one deeply considers that what it is, at the center of it is the accumulation of debt and the fact that SAPO operates as a tenant in South Africa, which only owns half of the properties it operates in. SAPO is a tenant of the private sector. Out of the 1,183 branches of SAPO, the entity is a tenant in 571 branches, which are projected to close due to failure to pay rent, electricity, and due to legal action against it from landlords. The tenant that is SAPO owes its landlords 255 million. That is why we're here today. And that is why SAPO has been put under provisional liquidation because of a state that insists on embarrassing itself by not owning land and property to even render the services it is charged with. SAPO is under provisional liquidation because it is a non-compliant tenant that is failing to remain relevant in an involving communication sphere. On the career services front, the post office cannot even categorize itself as a competitor because its failure to modernize its operational systems means it is a post office stuck in the dark ages and is unreliable. The recent allocation of 2.4 billion is more of a headache than a relief for SAPO because the entity doesn't know whether it will use the resources to offset its mounting rental debt, handle litigation, or modernize the services. It is therefore laughable in an exercise in futility to discuss a possible rescue of SAPO from liquidation and complete collapse because there is no strategy. Retrenchments which are already crippling the little remaining expertise at SAPO are not a means to create a revenue stream and further affirm that there is indeed a deliberate collapse of SAPO to ensure its privatization, which will lead to millions of South Africans being dependent on, ex on expensive private sector providers to render affairs such as couriering goods, payment of social grants and issuing of vehicle licenses. That is the purpose of the prolonged and deliberate collapse of SAPO and that is what has now led to its provisional liquidation. 
6.9 million grant beneficiaries will see their livelihoods threatened as government scrambles to find a means to disperse social grants. And ultimately, the parasitic tendering system will be the intervention which will be made surrendering the disbursement of social relief funds to the private sector. The interim solution is that the tenant state-owned entity called SAPO must serve as its debt that has been irresponsibly accrued due to foolish and reckless government that refuses to be independent. There must be money set aside for resolving the rental responsibility of SAPO and in the long term, the entity must own the buildings within which it operates. The long-term reality is that South Africans must imagine this untenable situation as South Africa continues to pursue narrow-minded privatization of state services. We must imagine the inability of services being provided such as electricity, water, railway services, because the private sector is willing to collapse an SOE whenever its profit margins are being threatened. The core objective of all South Africans must be the removal of the ANC from power as a matter of agents, or future generations will have nothing to inherit in this country. I thank you. Thank you, um, Honorable Tambo. I now recognize Honorable Majosi. Thank you, Honorable House Chairperson. Considering that South Africa has been part of the era of digital, digitalization for several years, arguably the South African police uh, po post office had to be aware of the major shift this would cause in consumer patterns. Their clear inability to focus such changes and to adapt and embrace the shifting nature of postal services can only be trumped by the entity's perennial failure to fulfill its primary uh, functions, namely that of delivering mail on time and to the right addresses. It constantly misses mail delivery targets that it sets for itself and today finds itself humbled and in provisional liquidation. Although Communication and Digital Technology Minister uh, Kongubele has called on support to prevent the liquidation, the IFP is still deeply concerned about support's financial health. This considering the post office most recent financial statement for 2021-2022 to end March 2022, which indicated that the entity owed creditors more than 4.4 billion and its debt exceeded its assets by 4 billion. Despite the, the near 8.5 billion of bailouts being paid to the entity over the last five years, it has merely been a case of throwing good money after bad. The so-called benefits to these citizens of, the, of this country of the post office remain below par in almost every aspect of its mandated service delivery. It is one story after the other. We have learned that South African police, South African post office could not pay medical aid for employees again. Many South Africans will not be able to get their SASA grants because some offices of South African post office will close. As the AFP, we can allow our people to suffer due to mismanagement of funds, we as the IFP will continue to advocate for a South African post office that has stability, a South African post office that is financially healthy, a South African post office that is able to provide service to the people of South Africa. Fortunately, the private sector has stepped up and filled the vacuum. Professional postal and career services are now available but at a cost that exceeds the capacity of the majority of our poor and most vulnerable. Further, according to Ms. Minister Ngugubele, if SAPO was to be liquidated, 6.9 billion beneficiaries who receive their grants and, and not less than 12,000 workers would also be affected. With unemployment figures sitting at 32.7%, the loss of 12,000 jobs would be devastating. They impact not only the, the employees, but also their extended families. It would also be a catastrophe catastrophe for millions of Sasa grant beneficiaries who would have to find alternative point, pay, pay points as well as resubmit IDs and RICA cellular numbers in the process. The government should be ashamed of itself. It not instituting corrective actions against the entity years ago. Its operation should have been re-engineered. The digitalization era planned for well in advance. It's tough, technical trained, technology embraced and declining 
uh, infrastructure uh, rectified. If we were to rescue uh, SAPO today, government will need to then uh, fill in another bill out of more than 6 billion, of which is money that we cannot afford. It's money that the government does, does not have. If then SAPO needs uh, uh, this, we need to get make sure that mismanagement it's something that the government deals with and they do not shy away from it. And we deal also with all the other shenanigans that are happening in these government entities. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Majosi. And I recognize Honorable Briet. Thank you, House Chairperson. The South African Post Office is essentially bankrupt. It is estimated that it owes its creditors at least 4.4 billion rand but cannot afford to repay it despite receiving bailouts, the latest of which is 2.4 billion rand for this financial year. It has also recorded financial losses for the past 15 years, but it gets worse. A reported release in December 2022 confirmed that the Postbank insiders have helped criminal syndicates steal over 150 million rand in Sasa grant money, money that should have gone to the most vulnerable in our country. The poorly secured post bank furthermore blocked grant recipients from making ATM withdrawals using their Sasa cards in December because a further 18 million rand was stolen. Going further back in 2020, it was reported that Postbank Master Key was stored incorrectly during a data center migration in July of 2018, and 25,000 fraudulent transactions followed. In Suel kan ons aangaan, dit gaan echter nie die situasie bereder nie. Die postkantoor lever in hoedzakelike diens aan Suid-Afrikaners in die vorm van sy sleutelmandaat, maar ook aan die meer as 7 miljoen sasa begunstigtes, wat afhankelijk is van die postkwa Postbank se maandelikse uitbetalings van die SASA toelaan. Dit is totaal onaanvaardbaar dat die postkantoor toegelaat is om so ver van die pad af te dwaal. Dit is ongehoord van nationale postkantore om so baie kantore toe te maak en dienste van gemeenskappe weg te neem. Dit is geen wonder dat skulde die hoogte inskiet nie, want as jy nie dienste lever nie, hoe kan jy een inkomste verwacht? Dit is echter uiterst arrogant van die minister en die presidentie om te sê dat bezighede en kreditere die postkantoorse financiële situasie uitwaait en, en dat hulle slechts beheer van die postkantoor wat die regering wil wegneem. Die plan vir die situasie waarin die postkantoor om bevind is nie te maak aan ander nie, maar slechts aan homself. Wat echter waar is, is dat die enigste oplossing vir die benarde situasie waarin die postkantoor omself bevind, die privatisering van die instelling is. Die postkantoor het een gulde geleentheid in die COVID-19 pandemie laat voorbij glip. In een tijd waar koureermaatskapie gefloreer het, kon die postkantoor minst slaan daaruit om die nationale verspreider te wees en ingekoop het op die verspreiding van goedere, maar hy het echter nie. Die postkantoor met sy verspilde kansen moet sy beleggingsplan indringend hersien, anders sal daar geen uitkomst gevind kan word nie. In plaas daarvan om bezighede te planmeer vir sy situasie, moet hy by hul gaan leer hoe om bezigheid te doen. As een verlenging van die regering speel die postkantoor en postbank een baie belangrike rol in die uitbetaling van Sasa Tula. Dit moes nie so lang gewag gewees het om die IT-stelsels te opgradeer om bedrog en diefstal te voorkom nie. Nou gaan dit 400 miljoen rand oor die volgende drie jaar kos om dit op te gradeer en wie weet, Op die huidige baan sal die postkantoor nie binnen drie jaar bestaan nie. Minister Nchaveni announced also with great fanfare in this house that the post office's so-called turnaround strategy will be playing a role in the economic and digital inclusion by giving rural households access to governmental services. This, Honourable Chair, is yet another sparkling example of how the ANC and its ministers have failed and are continue to fail South Africans, especially those from rural households. Sasa begunstigtes moet elke maand wonder waar hulle geld vandaan gaan kom en of daar vir hulle geld gaan wees. Dit is een loterij met mense se levens en dit is nie rechtvaardig nie. Die ANC faal Sasa begunstigtes, die ANC faal Suid-Afrikaners, Suid-Afrika verdien beter. Ek dankie. Thank you. The UDM. UDM. The ATM. ATM. Honorable Jafta. Honorable Jafta. 
I now recognize Honorable Maneli. Thank you, Honorable Last Chair, Honorable Minister and Deputy Minister, Honorable Members, fellow South Africans. This debate takes place a few days after we've commemorated Freedom Day and Workers' Day, which we celebrate annually on the 27th of April and 1st of May, respectively. These are significant dates on our calendar, which propel us to take a moment and reflect on how far we have come in our democracy and the continued struggle in our pursuit of a national democratic society, wherein the, the quality of life of all South Africans is uplifted, in particular that of the poor and marginalized, majority of whom are Black, female, the elderly, youth, children, and persons living with disabilities. Honorable members, our vision for a national democratic society is characterized by a thriving economy wherein the state is able to use its capabilities to direct national development through fiscal redistribution, utilization of state-owned enterprises, and effective regulation. This therefore foregrounds the ANC's response to, to, to today's debate as we speak about the provisional liquidation status placed on the South African Post Office and the entity's sustainability broadly. The African National Congress maintains that the South African Post Office has a developmental mandate and is a key role player in the provision of easily accessible and affordable postal services. It directly responds to the right of all South Africans to receive and impart information or ideas that is enshrined in our Bill of Rights through enabling the movements of communication and various other parcels with its massive geographic footprint. SAPO has access to 12 million households throughout the national address database and administers around 800,000 parcel volumes. We've also seen the post office play a central role in delivering learning materials or books to various schools across the country. Another important component in SAPO's operations is its partnership with the Department of Social Development for the disbursement of social grants. To this end, SAPO has facilitated the payment of around 100,000 SASA beneficiaries and facilitates transactions worth 6 billion rand to third party payments. While there are narratives that seek to suggest that government is intentionally creating dependency on social grants, it is worth also taking into cognizance the realities and lived experiences of a large population of our country, which is riddled with abject poverty and struggling to join the labor force due to historic economic exclusion and the contracted economy due to slow economic growth and slow recovery from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the 2021 July unrest and the sporadic natural disasters that we have been witnessing across the country amongst other things. In addition to these functions, SAP also plays an interesting role in the, house, in, in the housing and distribution of DTT decoders. Honorable members would know that the digital migration project is imperative to our agenda and program of ensuring digital inclusion, as it is closely linked to the release of spectrum and reduction of the cost to communicate. The world is going digital and technology is becoming more and more sophisticated. South Africa dare not be left behind. Honorable Chairperson, these are moment responsibilities that contribute to the socioeconomic fiber of our country. Therefore, as opposition parties advocate for the closure or privatization of SAPU, a question therefore arises, to what detriment should that be done? It is an open secret that the primary concern of private sector is profit maximization. Therefore, one of the two things are likely to happen should the entity be privatized. One being the cost of service will be escalated, thereby excluding the majority of people acquiring its services. Secondly, the scope of the entity will be narrowed to focus on cities and towns where there's economic activity leaving behind the many people who reside in villages and small dorpies who also need these services 
owing to lack of profitability. And this has been at least agreed upon by the IFP in its presentation that it does appreciate the private sector, but of course it costs more, even in the spaces where they are to reach such services, which then contradicts any possibility from their side to, to say that our people are still taken care of. Being placed under provisional liquidation is not a desirable state for the entity to be in. The African National Congress remains committed to turning around the entity and placing it on a path of recovery and self-sustainability. It is in this light, uh, Honorable Chair, that we welcome the proposals from government to rescue the post office and use the 2.4 billion allocation to catapult its recovery. It is regrettable that an allocation of more than 3 billion towards suppose 10 around strategy has been made by the national treasurer in the past. Yet we stand here today with an ailing entity and nothing to show for the recapitalization, except for offers to buy the entity, coming strongly from the former CEO, McBans, who is the very person who was entrusted with using that money to effect competencies and effective measures to turn the entity around. The historical record that has been given by the minister earlier on speaks to this period where we needed to have turned things around and things would have not turned around. And we must take this therefore as an opportunity to thank the patriots who have come to the post office irrespective of this ailing entity, but prepare, be prepared to make it turn around as they would have uh, come up with strategies. And therefore honorable members, with a dedicated patriotic men and women who are committed to making our state owned enterprises work, work for the greater good of society, the South African Post Office has the potential to get out of its current state into a path of successful implementation of the sub of tomorrow's strategy. In doing so, the following will be the integral, managing the debt owed to creditors, modernization of its business and postal network, transitioning the entity into a service platform, relaunching the logistics business, payment channel services, relaunching the support trust center, establishing digital labs. The ANC believes that these will enhance the entity service offering and therefore strengthen its business case. As it affects its strategy, we implore on support to strengthen its relationship or partnership with other government departments as well as various businesses within the private sector with the purpose to create public-private partnership, not the privatization, as encouraged in our economic uh, recovery and reconstruction plan. And, and therefore put SAPO as a service provider of other service providers. Furthermore, the African National Congress is of the view that the repositioning of Post Bank as a fully fledged state bank will not only be progressive for both entities as they leverage on each other's strengths and capabilities, but it will also deepen inclusivity as the entities will expand their reach and service offerings to black owned SMMEs and efficiently rolling out the disbursement of grants. The SAPO of tomorrow must make SAPO a going concern which optimizes its services and partnerships, embraces technology to serve the people of our country and parliament appropriations to deliver on the universal service obligation. This is the reason we must all work together to save SAPO as a state owned enterprise. And I want to submit chair as I conclude that indeed having listened to all those that have presented it's either we have complaints or in fact a repetition of what ANC proposes as a way forward. And it is for that reason that South Africans should be reminded that so far there have not been alternatives that have been put on the table to oppose the ANC policy, except to propel the African National Congress that it should implement its policies with vigor. And for that reason, South Africans should still place their trust and hoping the African National Congress ability to redress the situation, having learned from uh, the mistakes we have accepted, but we do have a plan 
on the table and the post office of tomorrow remains that plan and we should support every effort to make that plan a reality. I thank you, Honorable. Thank you, Honorable Maneli. I now recognize COPE. COPE, PAC, PAC, Aljama, Aljama. I now recognize Honorable Mazzoni. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Honorable Maneli, unfortunately, is living in a parallel universe if he thinks that South Africa has any trust left in the post office whatsoever. Many post offices have been forced to close down in the recent years. In fact, according to data compiled by the Outlander, the outlier rather, there were 1,512 conventional post office branches and 697 post office agencies in 2018. Today, there are only 200, uh, 626 post offices that are still operational. The South African post office workers are also facing a mass deal of retrenchment and wage cuts, according to the parliamentary report that was released of March this year. This despite the fact that over 6.3 million beneficiaries, or put in another way, 54% of 11.7 million beneficiaries were paid through the post office and post bank in January 2023. Postbank has stated that around 175,000 cards expired at the end of March this year. SARPA has stated that there is a gradual process to issue new cards and that almost all beneficiaries whose cards have expired last month have already received their new cards. We have yet to see this materialize. However, this is more frightening. Approximately 860,000 cards will expire in April of this year. Nearly 2.8 million will expire this month, and another 1.8 million cards will expire in June. SARPA has been placed under provisional liquidation earlier this year for failing to settle its enormous debt. The enterprise is now technically insolvent and has lost money every single year since 2013. It has been forced to close its branches across the country for years, and now it is forced to cut thousands of jobs. SARPO is on the brink of collapse, and we must be aware of this fact. It is facing complete and utter bankruptcy, despite receiving 8 billion rand worth of bailouts since 2014. Let's repeat that number, 8 billion rand worth of bailouts. A High Court judgment revealed that year-to-date loss at the post office since uh, 31 June 2020 was 1.66 billion rand. Only 55 of the post office's 1,416 operational branches were profitable. The High Court placed the post office under provisional liquidation in February with an application for final liquidation to be heard on the 1st of June, 2023. That date is fast approaching. A final liquidation is the worst case scenario. It will result in the post office operations closing permanently and workers permanently losing their jobs. The final liquidation of the post office will also cause a massive detriment to SA's social grant system and the SOE distribution social grants to more than 7 million beneficiaries every month. SARPO's financial situation is beyond dire, with liabilities outweighing its assets by a very heavy 4 billion rand of debt, and uh, of its assets of 4 billion rand and debt of 8 billion rand. In the latest 2023 budget, National Treasury announced that SARPA would get another bailout of 2.4 billion rand from the government coffers. This bailout is nowhere to be seen, and Chairperson, I can tell you that there is no money to bail out the post office. This follows the bailouts that I've spoken of earlier in my speech. Meanwhile, the group says it has been left with no choice but to retrench more than 6,000 6, people. That's 40% of its positions due to its financial constraints. It's noted that its wage bill makes up 68% of its costs 
and its business has simply become unsustainable due to private sector companies encroaching on services and government steering clear of using the post office itself. Let me repeat that. The government itself does not use the South African post office. In the proposed law, all government institutions will be encouraged to use services and infrastructure at SARPO to deliver on its services. This will not save the post office, I'm afraid, but will instead just hinder government entities from timelessly carrying out their duties. Instead, the provisionally liquidated South African post office should rather be urgently looking at ways to privatize aspects of their postal service to develop a practical and affordable delivery system to all communities across all our country as we align itself with the digital age to avoid its untimely demise. Honourable Member's time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize Honourable Bilangulu. Honourable Bilangulu. What's the most to me? Can San Carlo Mingan Nicawana? My Africa Zonga in Queno, Zamilosa, Ethican. Some was to Lu Ashikana Canisi. Go Mavanda Inqua, Yakukaneta, a parliament. A massa some machine novella. Kupuna, Kumbekuana, Lesako, and Bakahina, Basha is I never will in show me in Sangano what the A. Lola won never to make a corner. Bangaba take a little shop in one bakahina. I languetelangu and chum, supposative Bangashula. African National Congress, Sita and Mashweni, Kuwana Lesha Kusapo, Yapuniwa, Lesha Kukota Kutela Yima, Imlenge, Yita and Mashweni, Yiti Sam Korokeri, Ekavanu, Bakahina, Ilangutengo Puvanu, Lava Umaka, Emma. On a point of order, Chair. Thank you, thank you. Please uh, pause, Honorable Bilangulu. Uh, Honorable I did. Winnie. Chair, there's no interpretation services. Oh. Um, thank you, Honorable Ntlangwini. Um, can we please attend to the interpretation? Uh, um, because you must learn all the languages, man, Ntlangwini. Honorable Bilangulu, please, I ask you to pause. Um, I will gladly do that, ma'am, but I'm just thinking of the others. Thank you. Uh, you don't have to respond. Uh, <laughs> getting into a discussion here. Can we please sort that out, uh, the interpretation? It seems to have been working up until now. Uh, thank you. I hope uh, it's attended to. Uh, indicate if it's not attended to as we proceed. I will now uh, ask uh, Honorable Benbulu to proceed. Thank you very much, Chair. It is this disputable that structural apartheid in our country not only denied former generations the right to a dignified life echoed on a free will and self-determination, but it is also fostered systemat systematic reproductive of poverty, unemployment, and inequalities. This is evidenced by the social and economic exclusion we continue to witness today. At the core of today's debate lies the essential service of mitigating object poverty for millions of South Africans through the essential service provided by SAPO of the disbandment of social grant. There are about 18 million people who are beneficiaries of social grant every month. This is a drastic increase from 3 million people in 1994. This shows that over the years, government has expanded its social relief programs to ensure that all those who are in need again access to social security as propelled by the Freedom Charter and our constitution. Empirical evidence has shown that through the di distribution of the child support grant, nutritional outcomes have improved as a result of increased access to food, as well as educational outcomes, including improved schools attendance and educational attainment. Notwithstanding the challenges that SAPO has had as it relates to the distribution of the SASA grant, the ANC believes that SAPO has an obligation to its public mandate, which includes ensuring the SASA grant beneficiaries from across the country 
and in the most rural of areas are able to access their grant, leveraging on the geographical spread of SAPO offices. Honorable members, it is our firm belief that through stronger and more efficient state-owned entities that serve the agenda of South Africans and the nation broader socioeconomic vision towards 2030, that a process of supporting support to turn around and restructure through the successful implementation of its, of its corporate plan coupled with its public mandate is crucial. The Department of Social Development, Department of Communications, Support and Post Bank must look at ways in which they can all draw from their strength and capabilities to ensure that the disbursement of grants is better coordinated and implemented going, going forward. We remain concerned about the challenges and sustainability of SAPO. Their current lack of infrastructure capacity has proven hindered their operation and they have not been able to provide efficient distribution of grant due to the large scales. To this end, the Department of Social Development has ceded its agreement with the SAPO and the Post Bank is currently playing an intermediary and strategic role in ensuring that whilst effort as outlined by previous speakers to strengthen SAPO and increase its efficiencies and, co and competence, the beneficiaries of SASA are not negatively affected and further plugged into positions of vulnerability. Although the, the post bank plays a critical role in dealing with the disbandment of SASA grants to most beneficiaries in the main, there remains a strong link between the post bank and SAPO. This is particularly important because, also because a significant number of SASA beneficiaries still prefer to utilize SAPO as a main point of contact for some of their services, including accessing social grant. The modernization of SAPO services and systems is long overdue. As the ANC, we are encouraged by the plans in the SAPO strategy. However, we implore on all role players to ensure that it is fully and successfully implemented. If SAPO is to continue to carry out its public mandate, it is imperative that it stays afloat to prevent branch closures. Equally, more needs to be done to better mitigate against job losses without the entity and we support the proposed partnership with the Department of Labor and Small Businesses to help some of the support employees to venture into business partnership with the state. Honorable members, this provisional liquidation placed on SAPO and some of its operations and the implementation of its strategy is unfortunate. However, we hope that an amicable solution can be reached so that we turn the corner and have a stronger SAPO that will build its competencies on strong inf infrastructure solutions, including ATM infrastructure solutions in strategic locations. What is important to acknowledge and reflect on as it relates to the interventions that have been made to ensure that the developments related to SAPO, the Department of Social Development and other entities is that SASA has implemented interim strategies to manage aspect of the transition. These interventions include, but not limited a process of ensuring that post bank partners with other stakeholders to reduce the pressure on SAPO. This being partnerships with larger merchants, a process that is currently being implemented as well as smaller merchants such as Paza shops, a process that is yet to be implemented. There is indeed a need for government to strengthen efforts in order to ensure that the, credib the credibility of institutions such as SAPO is not undermined and, the, and they effectively contribute to our vision for a capable and developmental state. I thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Bilangulu. I now recognize Honorable Bordlani. Honorable Bordlani. Thank you so much, Chairperson.
please go ahead. Uh, Chairperson, perhaps I need to remind Minister Kungubele that before joining this department, he was the minister in the presidency with a bird's eye view on all government departments and entities. So unfortunately, his proposed interventions are reactionary and they happen on the eve of the liquidation of the state aid company, with the, big, with the biggest casualties being the poorest of the poor. The plans laid out by the minister today are nothing new. His predecessors, all 13 of them, have refused to acknowledge how SAPO failed to adjust to modern postal services and digitalization when the sector was transforming. Again, showing the short-sightedness of the ANC. I have to agree with Honorable Maneli. SAPO has nothing to show for previous pullouts. As Honorable Maneli correctly points out, the collapse of SAPO is a mistake, which he says the ANC has learned from. A very expensive mistake at the cost of the poor. The DA calls on government and SASA to stabilize the social grant services. Recipients should receive their grants with a sense of dignity. Chairperson, criminality remains a threat to SAPO and SASA. The irony is that the biggest beneficiaries of the partnership between SAPO and SASA are criminals who loot from the state millions of rents of grants meant for the poor. The lack of consequence management and low to non-prosecution of officials who simply resign once they are caught is a travesty of justice. The only measures to mitigate the impact the South African post offices of the South African provisional liquidation, I beg your pardon, Chairperson, the only measures to mitigate the impact of the South African post office provisional liquidation on the delivery of its commended, include, including payout and on behalf of SASA, is to get rid of this government and put in power the caring and capable DA government. During the Portfolio Oversight Committee visit to SAPO head offices, employees reported that they were asked to clean the bathroom in anticipation of our visit. This was confirmed by the CEO, who confirmed that SAPO cannot afford to pay cleaning services, a health and risk, a health and safety risk, yet we expect the same workers to help avoid liquidation. How? Honorable Bilanku, I am happy to report that the stars are aligning for the DA's moonshot pact to save South Africa. The on, DA on, in on the moon, just on the moon. Let's stop it there because your time has expired before you get to the moon. Ready to produce. Uh, Why, are Why are you getting that, involved, Chairperson? Why the Chairperson is getting involved? That concludes the debate. Of no, this don't go to the moon, Wena. Really? Why is the chairperson yeah. getting involved in the uh, debate? The mini plenary will now rise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>